Welcome to part B of week five. It's time to talk about price. One of the ideas that we're going to encounter in pricing, and we're going to go into quite a degree of detail on, is the idea of the non-financial price. The cost to the customer around aspects such as energy and effort and the difficulty factors involved in using software. This hooks back to some of the stuff that we have seen before around dark patterns, the intentional creation of high price alternatives where what should be a simple task, for example unsubscribing from a newsletter, turns into a multi-step several windows and a help manual plus a couple of arcane runes in order to actually find the right thing which is labelled as do you wish to not yes possibly maybe continue and it takes three goes of yes or no before you work out which one means what. So we want as marketers to not do that because dark patterns harm brand value. Dark patterns cause us problems and dark patterns are basically signs that you're a bit crap as a marketer. If you've got to trick someone into using your product, you're not very good at your job and you should be ashamed of yourself. So, the other thing, just a quick reminder, we're using SIVA as our cross-check framework. Since we're in pricing, one of the things with SIVA is that price is as much about the access as it is about the value. The value proposition is the total the total package of benefits compared to the total package of costs. But price also can be a barrier. It can be an access barrier. Not just in terms of can I afford the solution, but can I implement the solution where in terms of time, effort and energy. So SIVA opens our eyes towards the greater holistic view of how price can influence a consumer and also how that consumer's ability. Now this is where we bring back to co-creation, the operant resources. Can the customer unlock the value of our solution within a cost level that's reasonable to them, therefore can they get access? So let's go play with the pricing. First thing is a quick reminder, uh, we've seen this model before. Value is a calculative event. It is the perception of the product, any human interaction around the service, any human interaction around the engagement to acquire the product, and the social message that the product provides, the brand, the image, the what it means to be the only person in the suburb to be driving a Tesla, what it means to be the only person in the suburb not driving a Tesla. So that's the total consumer value. That's a calculative aspect. And one of our jobs as marketers is to remember that value comes from the product and it's filtered through the sense of the total price a customer has to pay. Good value is where the total customer value exceeds the total customer price. It can occasionally, you can occasionally try and drive down the cost so you can reduce the customer price, but you can also use price as a value proposition. And this is to hook back over to some services marketing theory for a minute. The higher the price on an uncertain item, the more likely it is that the customer will imply value. They'll think, well, if it costs that much, it's got to be good. Oh, I, I'm a sensible and savvy customer. I, I spent $1,500 on this piece of software. It's got to be good. And also, now having spent $1,500 on this piece of software, I'm doubling down by investing time, effort, energy, and I'm buying accessories and I sunk cost is your friend when in that respect. So in the terms of the costs, we've got four of the main players there, but we will deal with a few others on the way. The monetary cost, the time cost, energy, and psychic cost. 
these come together to form a weird Captain Planet of total customer price. But it's important to note that the financial monetary cost is only one facet. And it's only one part, and it's quite often a signal that may even lead into the image value. So, just a reminder, in this course, we split price into the customer side. So when we talk about, to the best of my ability, I will try not to say the word cost until we get to the producer side. I will get that wrong, but I will try. Price is customer focused. It is what the customer will exert in terms of finance or energy or effort. And it's what we control. It's the levels that we try and set to enable our customer to access or to deny non-customers of a proposition. Because pricing has two roles. Pricing has the role of enabling the audience you want, but it also plays a gatekeeper defensive role of keeping out the customer you don't. You can price something high enough that it takes out a certain type of market. And equally, you can price something low enough that a certain class of user who you don't want isn't prepared to buy it because oh, it can't be good quality. Why, that handbag's below $15,000. I wouldn't be seen carrying that. Filters are dual-edged swords. If you set a price, you can use that price to fend people off and bring people in. All right, so let's break it down into the initial pass, then we're going to go depth on each of the components. To understand what you're up against, on the non-financial price, you want to be thinking in terms of what behaviors the consumer has to undertake to get access to your product. Now, if we bring this to the internet, as we're going to, Time online, the internet's less observed than you'd think, but you can still have moments where somebody likes a tweet on, and next thing you know, it's a story in its own right. There are journalists whose job it is, is to sit there and go through the likes on other people's accounts to see what if there's a scandal or a story that they can generate out of somebody liking a tweet. One tweet. But this is also the things that the social communication, the social contagion approach of some of the social media sites where it will show you, you like content and it will post that behavior to your timeline. You like a tweet, it goes and acts as a retweet. You like, it will show you on Facebook oh, so-and-so liked this post. That creates observed use costs. That creates costs to the person who has pertained to like something, particularly if they thought it was private and they didn't know other people would be monitoring, watching, or observing, or that this wasn't a private action. On the internet, you also have things like effort. The, I do appreciate Twitter's current thing of uh, asking you, have you read the article? Do you want to read the article before you retweet the article? Which is annoying for people like me who often like to make jokes about headlines. I say, I don't want to have to do a, uh, like I'm being sent back to school where I've got to go and give a quick book report of the article I've just read before I'm allowed to go and retweet it. On the other hand, I can see a real value in having a, uh, to answer to an AI saying, yes, I've understood the article. Now, this was my understanding, and this is what I thought it was about. Hello, co-creation. Also, we see the return of an element of innovation adoption theory. Now, way back in Rogers' 1995 Five Factors, compatibility is one of the factors of innovation adoption. To what extent does the consumption of a value offer fit within my lifestyle or cause changes to my lifestyle? Similarly, risk makes a return. Uh, risk comes back as a perception. 
So it's important to understand here that in price, risk is a perceived factor. The actual outcome of risk is a post-purchase, post-consumption event. Uh, so it's not, at this point, as marketers, we are controlling the marketing mix to encourage the consumer to make their purchase decision, make their behavior. Any risk that came to pass would therefore become a part of their cognitive dissonance, part of their post-product evaluation. And lastly, the perception or the actual energy required to unlock the value. So when we talk about accessibility, when we talk about energy, uh, we will see this mentioned a few times. This is going to be something that is often overlooked as marketers, uh, particularly when it comes to things like the internet. There's this sense that somehow because it's on a computer, it's low energy, no energy, low cost, low financial price. Financial price. Now, this is... One of the things about the internet is that there's a lot of notionally free elements. So you don't have to pay a subscription to be on Instagram, which makes you the product. So if you, there is the internet adage that uh, if you're not paying for the service, then you are the product. But we also have costs around acquisition. So you pay to acquire the internet outright. You have to pay a subscription fee unless you're using the university, in which case you use, well, you're paying a subscription fee, you're doing it through your student fees. Uh, the use. There are times when you will pay a financial price for the use of an online service, and we're talking here subscriptions, or we're talking here microtransactions, DLC. Disposal is more in terms of physical goods, in terms of uh, paying for objects to be taken away or paying disposal charges, uh, such as if you were to mail back, you weren't satisfied with the product and you sent it back to Amazon, you would have a cost, oh, did it, I said cost. You would have a price incurred in terms of disposing of the object you no longer wanted. So there are some financial prices that are less prevalent involving uh, the internet, particularly when we're starting to think about digital technology, we're starting to think about the intangible, the digital intangible, and the tangible digital. In terms of financial prices, there are a few places where we want to, want to get you to think about the points in which money changes hands. Uh, where the little data set of processing goes through your PayPal into someone else's account. Now, the obvious one is acquisition, uh, buying a game off Steam, but then you've got acquisition extension, buying the downloadable content, buying the DLC, buying the next package. If you're a World of Warcraft player, then you have, or you play a massive multiplayer online that uses a subscription base, then you have a one-off, maybe you have a registration charge, or you have a subs ongoing subscription fee. It's possible to have digital consumables where you, in particularly in mobile games, where you buy, for $15, you can buy 200 gems, and you use those gems to play the game. So there are transactional elements here. The use, the one-off, is more transactional. The ongoing is closer to relational. Then you've got microtransactions. And we've had microtransactions for quite a while. It's just that they're very, very annoying as a platform approach for two reasons. Reason number one is companies have decided that instead of selling you a product, they're going to sell you an ongoing recurrent debt. Uh, so they optimize around making you think that the transaction is providing you greater value than it is. It's a little dark pattern-ish. But also, when a company doesn't stick microtransactions and micro markets and all sorts of the rest of that fluff into their game or into their operation, there's a whole cohort of people who will go out and criticize the company 
for not having microtransactions because it's a sign that, oh, well, they don't support this game. When Star Wars Squadrons first came out, because you didn't buy any of the cosmetics. You didn't have to pay $14.99 to unlock the A-Wing. You didn't have to pay extra to have Darth Vader's TIE Fighter. And there was huge controversy in the marketplace because there were people going, oh, well, just proof EA Games doesn't support squadrons if there's no ongoing financial b bleeding of the customer base, then they can't be interested in it, can't be a long-term product. It literally was had become a signaling tool to say whether a company was committed to a product based on whether they were going to keep taking money out of your wallet. It's terrible. It's like a complete misunderstanding of everything going on, but it's the sort of misunderstanding that becomes shared common wisdom, which then creates the market conditions by which failure to use a microtransaction or failure to have microtransactions in a product reduces the perceived value of the product and increases the product's perceived risk. The last thing is the disposal fees. Uh, digital disposal fees, this is where you have to pay an exit charge to leave a contract. Uh, you sign a two-year contract and there's a break clause. Hey, Telstra. Uh, you, or you have a payout fee. You have a nominal charge to exit a digital, ongoing digital transaction. That's got to be somewhere EA Games is currently looking at going and saying, well, I see you've stopped playing our game. It's fourteen ninety five to continue stopping playing the game. All right, non-financial price. Let's just quickly run through these because we're going to go depth and deep dive these. But if you're not familiar with this, uh, it is something that has informed my work. Uh, there is a... If you are interested in knowing more, urge to know more intensifies, let me know. Post a comment in the th forum thread or throw me a note. Uh, I will dig up the old PDF file of the chapter which I've based this stuff on. Um, that's an older chapter from a social change campaign way back in the 90s. But basically, your idea here is that you are looking at the consumer's behavior. What does the consumer need to do in order to use the value offer to co-create the value. First of all, we always need to spend time. Uh, this is something I'm conscious of when I'm recording these, these videos. Just think, for all the minutes you are spending watching this, they are the same length of minutes that I spent recording this. So there's a certain, there's a real timeness. Uh, can it be done in express time? Can it be done in real time? Effort is what's required in terms of sometimes physical outlay, sometimes psychological outlay. When it comes to this subject, there is a lot of psychological expenditure required because I ask you to engage with difficult ideas or I ask you to do things to undertake recurrent behaviors. And if you've never encountered non-financial price before, congratulations, welcome to effort and learning curve side by side. Learning kind of ties back into the value co-creation, the operant resources, and also ties into the access. It may be that at a very basic level, you've got a certain understanding of a product, but the more you use it, the more you suddenly unlock additional value propositions and value components. And that means that there is a learning curve for which the total possible maximum value doesn't get unlocked until you've achieved a number of sub-value points. That happens in this course quite a bit. Uh, energy is the result of effort. Uh, now, energy and effort are very closely related, but effort is basically when you are looking at something around, say, difficulty and compatibility versus energy is something can be very easy, something can be very low effort, but you still burn energy to do it. Something can be very high energy, low effort, you know, following along to an aerobics course on the YouTube, or it can be very high effort, very low energy, 
trying to understand an econometrics lecture or somewhere in between. And the last two, lifestyle and risk. Lifestyle is the extent to which you can bring in the consumption of this product without it making a change that you didn't want to your lifestyle. Now, lifestyle also ties into things like your social identity, your projected self, huge amount of consumer behavior stuff we're not going to go straight into. It will flick, you'll see it coming as a feature set when we get into things like uh, community as well. But lastly, risk, uh, perceived risk. Now, I want to remind you that risk is also a value proposition and that risk is a neutral concept here. That something has a risk attached to it does not make it good or bad. It makes it something that is a fit, good fit or poor fit to the risk preference of your consumer. So you can be risk seeking and a safe product can be a very a non financial price, very high non financial price because the product is safe. You have a risk seeking propensity, you need that little extra edge in your life and going on the safe ride at going on the safe ride at the theme park doesn't do it for you. Going on the ride where there's a risk of injury, that does it for you. So it's all about finding the product market fit and then using price both as a means to check in, is this what your target audience wants to expand to acquire your value? But also, is this a form of value in its own right that you can communicate to the audience? Because pricing influences perception of value and a better fit with the expected price is a better fit with the audience's desire for value. And the last example on this is time price for a game that takes four hours to complete. You pay $20 for it and it takes four hours to complete. That is either great value because you're going to get to completion and you're going to be happy about it and you're buying speed or it's going to be terrible because that's a lot of money for a very short time frame. That's like five bucks an hour worth of content. All about your market segment. How much discretionary price, how much discretionary time do you have in your budget to spend on a game? That will determine the relative value of $20 for four hours. So let's roll in deep dive with examples. Time price, as I mentioned, the case study here is how long to beat. It is a game telling you, it's a site that's gonna judge, well start with it, it's gonna judge you. No two ways about it. It's gonna look at your Steam game catalog and say how long it will take to play through your current backlog. How many hours? And uh, I'm kind of not prepared to log in and check just how I'm doing against the global community in fights and tight spaces. But this is a price estimator for time price. Same way, watching the Lord of the Rings marathon, extended editions, is a long weekend's worth of work. Watching the entire Star Wars trilogy is a long weekend's worth of work. And deciding you're gonna get up to speed and up to date on all the Star Wars back catalog before the new Mandalorian seasons come out. That is a month's worth of serious commitment to all the movies, all the TV shows. So everything has a time price. It's about you thinking where do you want to factor in and also the nature of the price that you have. Are you a convenience time? Are you an investment time? Start thinking about how you could describe your, or think about what place your product offer takes in someone's mind. Effort price. <laughs> Hi, sorry about the flashback to Neo Cities, but geez, that was good for watching people actually hit that effort moment of going, 
this is a lot of expenditure of my life for very little return. But at the same time, effort is, you want to understand your audience's need. If your audiences have a need for difficulty, for challenge, and for exertion, they will want something to be high effort price because that's a value proposition. Making something low effort by default, trying to always streamline it and make it easier, doesn't always appeal to the market. You've got to understand your market in that respect. Learning curve, and speaking of effort and learning curve combining, Dark Souls. The existence of this whole franchise, I would judge people harshly, but I am playing a video game, Tights and Fights and Tight Spaces, that I am yet to complete, and I have clocked up a lot of hours on it, and I still haven't gotten through. And I still get frustrated as I get eliminated very early on in this difficult game. So I get it. It's just I don't want to play Dark Souls. <laughs> I completely get it. But also, the learning curve is the fact that you are here at a university, you are studying a subject, means that you are all about scaling that learning curve like it's the warp wall in Ninja Warrior. Energy. All right, the internet and energy. The internet takes an enormous amount of energy. Uh, you will feel this coming out of the back of the live learning events, that the energy required to engage through the camera on screen is a different energy. Some of us find it refreshing to the point that, you know, it's as good a shot as uh, some cafe. Some of us find it very draining. But the end result is everything you do burns off some degree of the energy level you've got in reserve. Now, there's a number of theories, particularly around uh, from the disability frameworks around uh, spoon theory, spell slot theory. That's the far end, of, but a very good example of energy. In spoon theory, the idea is that you have a limited number of spoons in order to engage in your daily behavior. And some activities cost more spoons per day than others. But when you run out of spoons, that's it. You've run out of capacity. So if posting to the forum, reading a PDF article, updating your ePortfolio, and going to the live learning class, those are four objects. If you've got 10 spoons at your disposal, and the live class costs five, and the other two objects cost three each, you don't get everything done. And you can't get everything done because you run out of energy. Spell slot theory works a similar principle, which is the idea that you can, you have certain higher level ability to function. So certain tasks are more difficult, more challenging, and therefore take up more energy. Uh, the end result there is that when you engage in that behavior, uh, that's it. That's used up for the day. You've got to rest until you can do it again. But you can spend the energy you were going to set aside for a phone call, say phone call's level three, um, energy slot. You can spend it on a lower level task, but you can't use your lower level task energies to do a higher level activity. Energy is really important as a thing to think about in terms of does the engagement with your online product take a energy or does it create energy? Does it let people feel energized, relaxed? You know, if you're watching a YouTube video, do you come out the other side of it up or down emotionally? Um, do you come out of it drained? Do you come out of it exhilarated? You will spend energy either way. It's just how you're going to feel after the energy. And what sort of recovery time is required between energy exertions around your product? Lifestyle, uh, so I've mentioned this a few times, but the internet's really interesting for just if there is a community, you can find it. And, uh, shout out to all the new school goths out there. Us old school, very much appreciate you. Next generations are always welcome in the family. But the lifestyle also, one of the things I just want to say is that it is the 2020s, it's 2021. The internet is embedded and inherent in so much of 
the world's lifestyle now that it is amazing to me as somebody who came up in the pre-internet life where computers were a thing that you just didn't have. It was a rare market niche that had them and it wasn't a socially popular market niche that had them. And the idea of mobile phones and the idea of Instagram and the idea of watching these star athletes and their Instagram accounts I think it's brilliant. It is absolutely wonderful that the world has been able to embrace the internet and all this geek stuff that was held out, that was gatekeepered away from the public, is getting out there. So the widespread adoption of things like Dungeons and Dragons into people's lifestyles, the mass distribution of video games, comic book movies dominating the cinema, all this geek stuff out in the world and the world embracing it because it's no longer being gatekept from them. And at the same time, also being able to flip around and see all these things, these other lifestyles, these other communities, these other aspects that weren't accessible to us. The pre-internet world where we didn't have the capacity to find our people, to find those who are like us, those who have similar lifestyles. It was so much harder and it was so heavily gatekept because you were worried about outsiders. You wanted exclusivity, but you also denied access to the curious, to those who may be part. So it's freaking awesome. And lifestyle as a financial price, it is, you still got to find how it slots into who you are and how you engage in the world. But it is awesome. This is the democratization and the widespread access to more lifestyle choices is good. Financial risk. Okay, risk. I'm going to just focus on financial risk for a second here. Uh, GameStop, which was a big, you can see how that went. Sales and parachutes peaked here. thing about this is risk includes things like the fear of missing out. That there is a question on Google, is it too late to buy GameStop? Well, I should check what date uh, the Quora post was on. But functionally, it's this idea of being part. One of the biggest risks that appears is FOMO, the fear of missing out. But this also is, I, I know it's the foundation of several dark patterns, but it's also a self-inflicted element of judging your own lifestyle as less valuable because it's yours when you know other people envy you. There's a really great YouTube video I saw in terms of uh, fitness training, fitness goals. And this guy puts up three photos of himself, different points in his training, and pointing out to say that the middle photo is someone else's goal position of where, he, and yeah, he's got his base where he started, base where he was wanting, you know, where he got to as his peak and where he was now. And so that each of these were goals for other people. Like the body he was dissatisfied with was a peak piece of performance for someone else. The body that he wanted was someone else's dissatisfaction. So that's the thing about risk is it's all perceptual. And what you want to do with your product is you want to be thinking about, A, are you contributing to someone else's perception of risk? And if so, is it, what, is it creating value for them? And B, are you also having this moment of, is your perception getting clouded? Are you judging yourself not on standards you set for you, but on standards that are not yours? Therefore, you're running to the wrong metrics. So watch that in risk perception. Watch your metrics. All right, let's talk a little strategy here. Uh, now, most of the strategies we're about to talk about are based on price, price. based on financial price. This has been a much more human uh, lecture than you may have seen from the others. Satisfaction-based pricing. Now, the idea here is this is about creation of certainty that your expenditure as a consumer helps you feel that you've gotten value. So you think about that first model we showed, the first little branching diagram model from Coppola. It's about that balance. People have, are getting enough value and the price is such that they are 
satisfied that they're gaining more than they're expending. This is, I think, probably one of the best areas for non-financial price to work into is this is also about embracing all those non-financial price elements as potential parts of the value offer. You watch people play difficult video games knowing that that's a high learning curve, high energy, high effort investment, but those are features that they use to create their value of satisfaction. So satisfaction-based pricing is a very good way to think. Think in terms of does this price, does this financial and non-financial price enable my consumer, my customer, my target audience to access the value proposition and feel satisfied? The second level up is benefit-driven. Now, this is where you can stack on different layers of price opportunity. And I do see this a lot in online where it's very easy to create menu-driven customization. So you log in to a site, you subscribe, to, and they've got a basic package, and then you can add on features. Even something as straightforward as I'm going to buy a Dropbox account, which will have that will give me a backup plan. That backup plan has additional space per monthly charge. Or so it's quite easy to do this on the financial. People quite often see it and think about it as a um, so this drives more of the finance financial pricing. It's one I think would be very interesting to explore in terms of some of your non-financial elements of if I put that extra bit of effort in, what else do I get back? What do I get back next? But it's also the basis of co-creation of value when we start looking at things like uh, learning curve-based value propositions. Look, just quietly between you and me. This is how the subject is built. The more effort you put into your studies, so you spend the effort, you spend the energy, you're spending time, investing those into the purchase of the value of the subject. So if you put the yards in on the forums and you engage on the Padlet, and you watch the videos, and you run your project, chances are you're going to get more of the experience which will benefit you, and you're able to buy in greater outcomes at the end of semester and the post semester. But you do that as a pay. It's a set your own price, set your own energy, set your own inputs. So I do use this. So this, this is the framework that underpins the co-creation model that drives the subject. Of course, on the other side, there's flat rate pricing, uh, where you just you pay your nine ninety five, and as the provider, I hope that that covers the costs, no matter what the use is. So it's your all you can eat model as your flat rates. Uh, flat rate pricing for time, energy, and effort would be really interesting. That you're only going to get you're only going to put fifteen minutes in, whether you get through the uh, get through it in fifteen minutes or not. No, end of fifteen minutes, I'm out be very interesting to try it and I think that would be one that if you wanted to do this to really make use of something like your bullet journal to see if you could pull up flat rate pricing of consumption I'm only going to spend 15 minutes on YouTube or I'm only going to give 15 minutes to Instagram after that timer goes beep job done uh, relational pricing now this is one I think is the internet facilitates quite well and this is the uh, idea of the longer term, the midterm, that you see it always in subscriptions. You've got free, you've got monthly, and then you've got build yearly, and it's always 10 months. Two months. Pay yearly, get two months free. It's like, well, now we know your actual costs are only 10 months worth of money. But basically the idea here on the relational is that you want to keep people engaged, you want to keep people in the operation, you want to keep people's part. 
financial, really easy. Dead easy to set up. It's a monthly and that's a discount for large for larger and longer term. I would say that this is one area where the more effort you exert into in relational pricing, this is going to help you reduce the overall price for the customer is that as they get more experienced in using your product, it becomes easier, therefore the effort cost goes down, therefore the time costs can also go down. Or the time cost remains the same and they get further through the product. So what used to take me 30 minutes worth of gameplay to reach in terms of a game, I get better at those first couple of levels, it takes me 15 minutes and now I've got 15 minutes of new content if I'm putting 30 minutes into, investing 30 minutes into the game. Price bundling, we're very familiar with these as well. Amazon's amazing about it. You look up a cat tree and boy does it give you a bundle of other things you can buy your cat. Uh, Price bundling as well, I think this is the basis for a lot of the non-profit, non-financial pricing. A lot of the stuff that we do and a lot of the ways I've been talking about this, again, I'm explaining the elements as individual parts, so you think about them consciously and you change each of the dials, but the whole thing applies together. So. The price bundles that come in, the value offers that come in together in terms of the non-financial time, effort, energy, when you are, okay, I'm going to have an Instagram account, so I've got certain things that are going to happen there. I subscribe to a bunch of different feeds. I'm now getting a bundle of different uh, images, messages, ideas, concepts. So the single price point is the time, effort, energy engagement through the Instagram. Uh, again, this is the thing to look for is where can you bundle in your value offer so that it is part of a bigger package of content or experiences for your end user. Which is also why you want to care about your end user in terms of market segments and you want to think about positioning and you want to think about distribution because price bundling will work really well with distribution because distribution and product come together to create product bundles and just like that on Amazon. Whilst on the surface, I can give it as a price bundling example, it's a product bundle, it's a value bundle, and it's a distribution bundle. Uh, the ultimate mixed bundling is where you can buy parts A and B together or purchase one separately. Big shout out to Call of Duty for nearly $1,400 worth of software. Remember what I said about pricing and prestige pricing and all those other things? But basically, functionally, again, for that's Call of Duty, that's really easy to look at the money side there. You can buy each of the individual components, and then you've got to play your way through them. Adaptive pricing, this is also where you can modify, you can use menu-based selection. I went to Vistaprint and said, well, I'd like a... I would like a tangible business card for this subject. Full digital subject does not require paper card. But for the case illustration, I could then just upscale it a little bit. I could add in a better type of paper, or I could change the corners, or I could do different things, each of which allowed me a menu-driven, customized pricing, financial price at the end. You will see a similar thing occur in terms of, uh, you often see this around effort and energy pricing. And there are a whole series of adaptive pricing strategies. This is an area I think you've got an opportunity to really explore in terms of your own projects, to think about what changes in the consumer's perception of your price if you modify these elements. So if you go from YouTube 45 minute videos down to TikTok with a cap on its limit to working on Instagram with a one minute, two minute, to working on Twitter to what are the product size? What does that do in terms of things like your price, for your time, your effort, your energies? What happens when you change your channel? What happens if you require your customer to subscribe to multiple channels to get the maximum value offer? 
play with these concepts and your project, explore them, really dive in to say, what happens if, and where is the best fit between what I want to offer, what I want to create, and what my market is looking for. Now, last couple of things to say in this respect, total price, that is non and financial price, so non-financial and financial price together, you want the consumer to be able to make a reasonably quick snap judgment because they're going to make some snap judgments about your product based on its price. So you want them to be able to go, hmm, I see the product, I see the value offer, I can now work out the relative price, I can work out its total price and then I can start slotting it into my internal schema of positioning strategies and products like this should, my reference price, so products like this should have a reference price around this much energy, this much time, this much effort. I know that the digital marketing, e-marketing subjects reference price is something that people have struggled with, that there is a perception around the subject in terms of what subjects are like it. Therefore, what subjects should I be judging in terms of the amount of time I've got to spend? Uh, the other thing around your total price is, functionally, this is what's going to help with the value creation because the customer is going to derive value from their co-creation behavior and they're going to subtract their price, their expenditure. You want there to be a positive difference. You want there to be a reason for them to do this again, to come back. And last thing is you want to be really conscious at this moment around what can the financial price do to vary the non-financial price? Can you buy in, can you buy time, can you sell time? So I mentioned a little bit about prestige pricing, uh, price in services marketing. We talk about the idea of price as a signaling tool. It's a quality metric, it's a proxy. But this also then works where there's uncertainty or it's difficult to engage with a product, a physical good. You use price as a proxy signaling mechanism. The more expensive it is, the assumption is the better quality it is. So price signaling in the marketplace is quite interesting. You, again, can use it for positioning, but you can use it for gatekeeping. A low price can keep out key audiences you don't necessarily want because it's too cheap for their reference pricing. They'll think something's wrong with it. They won't purchase. Price as driver of demand, price for social status. I'd like to introduce you to the world of Counter-Strike and its secondary market in selling digital intangibles. Those prices are real that you follow the link to that site and you will see their live real-time pricing for how much people are actually spending real dollars. That's 60,000 US dollars to buy a digital artifact in the Counter-Strike Go game servers. And that's freaking brilliant because someone out there is getting enough value, 60,000 US worth of value, or it's at least the social status of being the exclusive holder of that particular artifact is deemed to be worth $60,000 American. And if they get, if someone pays for it, they're going to be getting that worth of social status. So it's, you know, this is where the NFTs want to get to. This is where they're not at at the moment. But also this is no different to only exclusive trading cards or only exclusive art. So if you're gonna have a go at people for dropping this sort of currency on an exclusive digital object, you also gotta put the booty into art galleries anywhere who have spent money on paintings or any art. Now a couple of other things around pricing. Uh, price for convenience, speed, 
basically purchasing speed upgrades uh, in your distribution channel. So we talked about how distribution adds into the total price concept. Here, price interplays with how fast can I get the object based on how much I'm prepared to pay. Uh, in this case, shifting between, this was actually a really good uh, clean thing of the standard delivery comes in, the d has a one day window overlap with the expedited delivery. I have occasionally seen expedited delivery offering me a date range that was worse, longer and further away than the expedite, than the standard delivery. Price for signaling, exclusivity. Okay. This is something that we do a lot in physical goods based marketing. We'll create a one of a kind or a limited run, limited a thousand copies, 500 signed editions, numbered signed editions. We have an absolute marketplace of this stuff. So the criticism here is not the theory. It's not the behavior. It's not the fact that actually I own a number of limited edition objects that part of the appeal was, yes, there's only going to be a thousand of these, which meant that I wanted it enough that I was prepared to be one of that thousand who owned it. So I don't have a problem with people going into creating exclusive objects and creating restricted objects and value co-creation through mere ownership. What's got me is that the non the NFT is not that. It can be displayed, therefore it can be copied. Also, everything about um, the Ethereum pricing thing that happened here, I just had a moment of reading this and going, there's a whole series of worlds that exist out there. There's a marketer. I have to be able to point you to and say this exists, but I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crypto kitties, just yeah. Let's go back to stuff that makes me work happier. All right. The other thing uh, I've mentioned positioning a few times, and we'll pick it up again when we get into advertising. But price only exists in one of three states. So whatever price you are thinking about, whatever aspect, there's only one or three positions you can be in, and that is you are either at the market, so you're the same or similar, you're at market rate, you're below market, or you're above market. There are only three positions to be in, equal, greater than, less than. There are strategies attached to each. And this is something that a conscious choice in this area is very, very useful for you as an e-marketer. You can decide to take a premium position on any one of your financial or non-financial prices that makes sense to your audience. The whole existence of complexity as a feature of a product means that you can put difficulty, perceived risk, perceived functional risk, energy cost, effort cost, lifestyle, learning curve cost, and market premium. We play maths for fun. The existence of the Sudoku game as a concept, hmm, let's do maths. That's fun. The existence of competitive spelling bees, Scrabble, I know, Let's play a game to compete who can play the dictionary the hardest. All these are effort costs above market. And they work. And they position the product in that particular area. They create value. So positioning, price positioning creates value in its own right. It communicates value. It reinforces your advertising message. It reinforces your distribution channel message. And it contributes to perceptions around the total value and the total value proposition for your offering that has value. So work right this week. Look at 
your project and look at where you see yourself on all the different pricing arrangements here. Are you at the market, above the market or below the market? And where do you want to be going forward? All right, I'm going to flip the switch for a moment. We are going to the other side. Now, barring one or two mistakes, I tried not to say cost in the first part because cost isn't price. One of the most common mistakes a marketer will make is the marketer will go, product, this is the value offer for my customers. Promotion, this is the message I'm going to tell my customers. Distribution, this is how I'm going to get to my customers. Price, this is what it costs me to make it. Like, no, no. Price is consumer still. Price is what they have to expend to acquire the offering that has value. On your side, you need to be able to address costs and engage with costs because you need to deal with that because that's what you incur in the creation of the offering that you're going to put out to the market. So there's a whole set of ideas here that I want you to experience. I want you to look at this list and you've got this in the slides. The purpose of this list is not for me to talk you through each and every element of it. It's for me to point you at its application. I'm going to ask you to do an exercise. This is one of the few exercises that come from this side of the course content. I want you, over the next week, to start thinking about different costs and different parameters. And specifically, I want you to start going and measuring your own cost exertion. What are you spending in terms of time, effort, energy, money, and all the rest? What are you spending on your projects? And at what point in your week do you break even on your subjects? Do you break even on your project? Or how far into various uh, debts are you going? What time debt or energy debt or effort debt are you going versus the value you're getting back? Now, if you find yourself at any of these points going, geez, I'm practically underwater on the effort versus return here, look at your co-creation, look at what you can do to extract more value. But play with this concept framework. The other thing I want to draw your attention to here is be mindful of when you are pricing something for the market. Now, this particular uh, mask, you will periodically see it for sale on some very dodgy Facebook ads that there is no way in hell what they are selling is the real thing. This is an Etsy-based product. Uh, you can see the Etsy store there. But they will sell you the component parts for a price. And that price is quite reasonable. It's about 150 Australian plus shipping, which is probably about 70 bucks. But you can buy it. That's for making it yourself. Alternatively, you can pay the manufacturer to make it. And that costs you roughly $200, which you then divide by the minimum wage in the US, and that's up to 21 hours. So if it takes the maker of this product, with their experience, because they designed it and they've made more of these beforehand, and they have all the pre-existing equipment they need to, to make the object, if it takes them more than 21 hours, they're running a loss. If and that's just time. That doesn't include the investment they need to do in the main, in the materials or anything else, or any consumables that they'll get through, or the depreciation on the equipment that they're using. They have 21 hours to complete that task before they are at a loss on investment. Similarly, on the other hand, you can now see that there is a proposition here. There's a value option that will it take me more than 21 hours? Do I have the resources and the equipment to do this? What is going to be my outlay to be able to self-service, co-create, hand build this myself versus, okay, that $200 is a lot cheaper than my time, my effort, and my energy. So this is a really good time versus cost scenario, but it's also really important to know when you're pricing your own products, factor in and calculate. 
Which brings us to the task challenge this week. In fact, this is something to do periodically in your life. Keep a time lock. Then start billing against projects. Just start tracking how many hours from the point you watch this video to the point you watch the next video. If you're Netflixing it, sorry. Just track your week. Use your bullet journal to track your week on all your projects, on anything you're working on for all for any of the subjects you're doing this semester, anything you're doing for me, anything you're doing for your projects, your e-marketing project, any money that you spend on it, any time you spend on it. You can even do evaluations of the effort and the energy. Start looking at what your weekly outlook outlays look like. We also have a couple of cost calculators uh, in place so you can work out what your projected break-even is. How much will it cost to, or how many days do you want to work? What sort of income do you want to have? Uh, particularly if you're currently are holding a job and you are thinking about shifting jobs, this is very useful for starting to work out if you want to go out, set up your own consultancy and run freelance, how many jobs do you need to take at what price before you are going to break even and before you are going to meet what you're currently earning in your other employment. And lastly, uh, this is a particularly useful tool uh, around setting an hourly rate. It's the biggest challenge that exists in all, I mean all, of services marketing, of which we are included. Someone comes up to you and says, well, oh, I want to get this project done. How much do you cost? And then you've got to turn around and say, well, I'm 70 bucks an hour, or I'm 150 bucks an hour, or I'm 240 bucks an hour. Those were three prices for what the ANU charges for a lecture. And there are assumptions underpinning each of those. So we'll, we can talk about that in the, in the seminars. But basically, run some calculations, run the numbers, and let's close it out talking about this week's theory. Uh, this week's theory is about the use of pricing as a barrier. So I've talked a lot about co-creation and how value can price can create value. This paper talks about looks at microblogging uh, and unfollowing. And specifically, it looks at that you can raise the perceived price of quitting following a content creator because you can create then a competitive barrier to retain that person entirely around the fear of missing out. The leaving cost of, yes, but what if I don't get to see that exclusive piece of content I see nowhere else? This I would use uh, as a way to understand some of my own behavior, maybe why I've stayed on content areas I thought I would have quit earlier, why I'm still subscribed to things that maybe I thought I was going to give up, but also might be an interesting way that if you are looking at a more mature uh, product, so you've been running your social media account for a while, you've been running your online presence for a while, and you want to retain customers, there is, now, I'm always a believer in create more value rather than raise costs, but there is a role and value for cost as a mechanism of retention, and this is the paper that runs you through it. So, with that, as always, you can reach me on any of the platforms, hit me up on the socials, connect across the email, or use Wattle and the contact protocols to get in touch. This has been much more of a meta class than you will normally get because even the fact that it has taken one hour and four minutes to get here is a time price. So we're conscious of the content itself reflects one of the aspects that we talk about in the content. Welcome to the very meta nature of e-marketing. Enjoy your stay. And I'll see you in the next episode.